happen. First John chapter 2. Beginning at verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you, that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And so, as mentioned, I'm going to look at verses 1 and 2. That actually gives to us an opportunity to hearken back to chapter 1 to get the flow of what is taking place. It lays a foundation for us, and then we'll move into verses 3 through 6 and conclude today's um, time in the Word where we're looking at the subject of a walk in the light. Now, John has been instructing his readers concerning the fact that God is light. When you uh, read the writings of John, he likes to make statements concerning what God is. God is spirit, he says. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John says uh, he, that God is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God, he said, for God is love. So he likes to make, and he does make these, these statements about God to give to us an insight into what God is or who God is. God is, is light. God is spirit. And, uh, and the bottom line is, is that the Lord God has, has certain qualities about him that uh, John wanted us to know. So he had just instructed his readers concerning the fact that God is light. You see that in verse 1 of chapter, or rather verse 5 of chapter 1, when he said, this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So God is light. Uh, it, that agrees, obviously, with the Old Testament, Psalm 104, verse 2, where it simply says, he wraps himself in light as with a garment. And so when it speaks concerning God as light, that's intended to reveal to us that God is holy and that God is righteous. Because God is holy and because God is righteous, those who are his children are also going to live as holy and righteous people. We will live holy lives and righteous lives. And that's why uh, John, in verse 7 of chapter 1 again, encourages us to walk in the light. He says in verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so God is light. We as his children are to walk in light. So walking in light is another way of saying we live a righteous life. Living a righteous life. We have fellowship with God. Living in a, in a particular way enables us to continue in our fellowship with God. And uh, we live in a continuing walk of fellowship with God because uh, we understand that God is holy. In Psalm 99, verse 5, it simply says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. In Isaiah 5, verse 16, it reads, The Lord Almighty is exalted by his justice. The holiness of God is displayed by his righteousness. Isaiah 57, 15, Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God is in Scripture over and over again referred to as the one who is holy. He is exalted. He is righteous. So if God is holy, then those who are truly his children will also be holy. In 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God, who chose you to be his children, is holy. For he himself has said, you must be holy because I am holy. And so they're going to walk in the light. And as they're walking in the light, 
as we walk in the light, we will maintain close fellowship with God. And so that's the call. Like it says in Isaiah 2, verse 5, O house of Jacob, come ye, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So walking in the light. Walking in the light is a way of life that is centered on fellowshipping with God and honoring God. Walking in the light is evidence that you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And Jesus in John 8, verse 12 said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John 12, verses 35 and 36, Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he's going. Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light. We are to walk in the light because we have the light of life. We can walk in darkness or we can walk in light. And, and I, know, I know the difference, and all of us do spiritually know the difference between walking in spiritual darkness and walking in spiritual light. We know that we've been enlightened by the Holy Spirit when we got saved. He opened, a, opened us up. He illuminated our darkened understanding, and he gave to us insight. That actually, we have a look at the face of God through Jesus Christ. And, and so spiritually, we've been made alive, and we walk in light. I, uh, I have night blindness. And uh, which simply means that if all the lights went off in this room here right now, I wouldn't move. Because you, if, if I did, you'd hear a sound of me falling on this table here. I mean, I, could, I couldn't see the edge of this in the dark. And, and uh, you know, I, I came walking a couple of years ago. I came walking out of the back in the main sanctuary. I came walking out of the back towards the stage area to go into the front of the church. All the lights were off, and I didn't see a thing until I bumped into one of the uh, props that we had for VBS. And when I hit that prop, I, it, it hit, I hit it so hard and it, I stopped so abruptly, I pulled my hamstring. And so for me to walk in the darkness is not only something uh, that's not real wise, but it's also painful. And so if you're walking in darkness, it's unwise and it and ultimately will be painful. Some who are claiming to be Christians um, in 1 John, we're not walking in the light. And they were claiming to know the Lord, but they weren't walking in light. And that is confusing to those who are watching them. So John is giving tests as to whether or not they truly are Christians. Um, how, do, how am I going to put this? Because I didn't really mark this down. I didn't write notes so I could clearly say it, so I'll say it in a muddled fashion, but hopefully it'll make some sense to you. Um, we've been going through John, rather, I'm sorry, we've been going through Matthew on, on Sunday morning. And we've been in, as you know, those of you who've been with us, we've been in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and we've been going through chapter 7. We're about to conclude chapter 7 next time we get together. And when we began chapter 7, remember how the Lord Jesus Christ in the first verse there gave a scripture that I mentioned to you is probably one of the most misquoted scriptures in the Bible where he says, judge not lest ye be judged. And, and I was mentioning to you that there are quite a number of people who, who feel that, that Jesus Christ is, is saying, do not be discerning. You see... We are not the ultimate judge of anybody. God is the ultimate judge. We know that. And yet we have to have discernment. It's interesting how that Jesus says, do not judge, and, and then goes right on into telling us, don't be casting your pearls before swine. And then, and then he begins to speak later on, as we've recently seen, uh, concerning false teachers, and you'll know them by their fruit. Jesus was not saying for us not to be discerning. What Jesus was saying is that if you're going to be making judgment, the very first person you ought to judge is yourself. Because how can you remove a speck from a brother's eye when you yourself, he said, have a beam in your own? So the real beginning of judgment is always self-judgment. Because, listen, because when you examine your own life, it brings humility into you. Because you're aware of the grace of God and how much needed it is for me. And therefore, I'm not going to judge you harshly because I see myself for who I am. That will bring humility 
so that I can be an encouragement to you to walk for Jesus Christ. So it's not, it's not intended to destroy, it's intended to encourage people. And so don't have a judgmental spirit when you're trying to bring somebody to a, a correct place in the Lord. Always examine yourself first so that you may first see yourself for what you are, how much you need Jesus Christ. It brings humility into you. You won't speak with arrogance, and you'll have wisdom and discernment when it comes to bringing correction, right? Amen. And so that's what the Lord would teach us to do. It's not that, that I should ignore sin that's obvious, because if I really love a person and they're in sin, the real love is to encourage them to walk right with God. That's real love. That's why Paul would ask the Galatians, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Is it so difficult for you to receive from me, Paul, an apostle? Is it so difficult for you to receive from me the truth to the point that you have thought I'm your enemy because I point out areas of your life that God wants to work in so he can bless you? Is that how it's gotten? Now, that was back in the time of Paul. Is it that way today? Absolutely. Absolutely. The message I just gave just this last week, you know, there are those who think that the message I was giving um, is a judgmental message. When in reality, it's a call for us to be careful that we don't have just a head faith or a said faith, but an actual living faith. And so what I was sharing with you on, on Sunday is, is really this is part two, in a way. I wanted to build on that a little bit further so that we might understand what it means to walk in the light. And so some were claiming here in 1 John to be Christians, but they were not walking in the light. And that brings confusion. And so John gives them three tests of whether or not they're believers. First, you see that, in the first test in, in chapter 1, verse 6, where he says, now, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. The first test is, do you live in habitual sin? If you live a life of habitual sin, unrepentant habitual sin, you're not fellowshipping with the holy God. Second, you see in verse 8, where he says in chapter 1, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Second, there are those who are denying that they had a sin nature, and if you deny you have a sin nature, you don't understand your own nature. And then third, verse 10 of chapter 1, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. And so another, another way to test is, do you deny that you even sin? My mom uh, was sharing the gospel with a woman and thought that she had thoroughly covered what needed to be shared in order for the woman to have enough gospel to make a decision for Christ. And mom um, said to the woman, would you like to receive the Lord as your savior? And, and uh, the woman said, yes, I would. So my mom says, oh, let's pray together. Repeat after me, Father, forgive me a sinner. And the woman said, now, wait a minute. I'm not a sinner. And, and there are people who are that way because we, we get the idea of sinner and we say, well, you know, only the worst of the worst are really sinners. Hitler, he's a sinner. You know, or uh, Charlie Manson, blast from the past, some of you younger people. Charlie Manson was a monster from the 70s. And so he is evil, incarnate. And so they'll say, well, I'm no Hitler, I'm no Manson, I'm not like that. No, what he's saying is, uh, one, if you deny that you have a sin nature, you don't have a relationship with the Lord. Or two, if you deny that you sin, you don't understand what holiness is. And so John desires these believers to walk in fellowship with the Lord. And that's why he's instructing them. And that's why he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. I'm writing this so that you might live a life that is pleasing to God. Now, when you go through 1 John, in the letter of 1 John, John lists at least four reasons for the letter being written. He said in chapter 1, verse 4, that the letter is written that they might have joy. In chapter 2, verse 26, he has written to keep them from deception. And then 
in chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, he writes to give them an assurance of salvation. Here, he is saying, I'm writing to keep you from living a life in bondage to and earmarked by sin. Now, John is writing from what is called a shepherd's heart. Notice how he begins here in this verse. He says, my little children, my little children. That's a very, that's a tender way for this elderly apostle to be writing to these people. He could have been 90 years old or so at the time that he wrote this. And so he says, my little children. Um, the word um, is used when he speaks concerning little children is used as a term of endearment. And it would be used by teachers when they spoke to their disciples. So he's an older man. He loves these, these readers as, as little children. And as a pastor, he has a great concern for the welfare of the church. John's desire that all pastors would share is for the church to have joy, for the church to live holy lives, that are filled with God's love and God's truth. When he writes his third letter in 3 John verse 4, he says it like this. He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And that's a genuine desire for every true shepherd. So here in verse 1, he simply says, I write that you may not sin. I'm encouraging you to live a life of holiness. Now, when he says that you may not sin, that's a reference to a life that's earmarked by and filled with a continuous sin. He's saying, I'm writing to you that you don't live a life of continual and habitual sin. Uh, I, I had mentioned, I, I mentioned this yesterday when I was speaking to the, to the pastors all and all, but I mentioned, and some of you perhaps were in the church service when I said this, and I'll say it a second time at this time. Hopefully, we'll clarify what could have been and was misunderstood when I was sharing that my son Joseph had had a, uh, a conversation with the man when Joseph was going to Bible college at uh, Murrieta. And this man had said to Joseph, what is it that your father has done in your life that has helped you to stay solid with Jesus Christ? And I mentioned that Joseph told the man, my father has never intentionally sinned in front of me. My father has never intentionally sinned in front of me. And I said to the church, that's true. And it is true. I've never intentionally sinned. Well, somebody was really upset, not upset, but questioning, are you saying you're perfect? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and that was an honest question. And I think it was, it was a good question. There was nothing wrong with the question. I think it was a good question. Were you saying you're perfect? And the answer, of course, is no. Now, what I was saying is, and I'll say it again, is that I didn't intentionally. Have I sinned? Of course. Of course. Have I intentionally? That's different. That's a different, intent is entirely different. There are times that you sin, you miss the mark, not because you're planning to. It's because you do, because you have sin nature. And you might be doing the best you can, walking with the Lord, something happens, you lose your temper, something goes on that, that mm, you know, Jesus isn't there and the flesh is, and your kid sees it. Oh, well, that's one thing. That's not something you planned on doing. You didn't wake up this morning saying, let's see, at about 11.15, I'm going to hit my thumb with a hammer and probably say some words that they've never heard before, strung together in a way that is very creative. You more than likely didn't do that. And so there's a difference between intent and entering in through a weakness of the flesh. That's why we pray that we enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? And so he's not speaking about the fact that people sin. He's saying, I'm writing this so that you don't live a life of continual and habitual sin. That sin will become the infrequent element of your life, not the thing that people know you about, by. And, and that's what he wants. I want you to live a life that's not in bondage. So he's encouraging his readers to live a life that's earmarked by holiness. 
and, and it's not a, a continual sin. Uh, some people will beat themselves up because you, you aren't perfect, you know, and, and um, I, I don't want to give anybody permission to go out and continue sinning tonight. I'm not going to say, you know what, you know, God loves you. And you say, yeah, he said he loves him, so I'll go out and have a beer and celebrate. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is don't beat yourself up because you're not perfect. You know, don't beat yourself up. You know, uh, I think if you're anything like, like me, you probably are your own worst critic anyway. I, I mean, people have, have told me what a sinner I am, and I say, you don't even really know me. I'm worse than what you think. I mean, so, so when have I ever presented myself as being perfect? You know, I'm not. I am a sinner in need of the grace of God. And just like you. But over time, God works in your life, and your appetites change, and you have a hunger for him more and more, and you desire more of his spirit, and you walk more, more, with more fruit in the spirit in his life because that's the process that's called sanctification where, where the, that old way of life is, is, is gradually but surely is, is, is fading, and this walk of the spirit is on the ascendance. And that, that, that does happen, and God does work in that way in our lives. And so that's why he would have written chapter 1, verse 9, when he said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, because he wrote that, some may have considered that permission to continue in sin. So he makes his purpose of writing this letter very clear. Do not continue living in sin Again, no matter how much we desire to live right, we will fall short and we will sin. That is part of our human nature. And because that is true, God has made provision for us. Notice what he says in verse 1. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. In the Bible, it's interesting you have one referred to as your adversary. Your adversary is who? Satan, the devil. You have what is called an adversary. And uh, the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. In Revelation 12, 10, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So you have an adversary, and that is a prosecuting attorney. Some of you have been arrested, I know. And um, you've gone to court, and you had a prosecuting attorney who did everything that they could do to prove you guilty. He is your adversary in court. He used to be called the adversary because he was going after you and bringing up all that you did and details and getting you to admit to him. And so you have an adversary, even if you've never been to jail, even if you've never been to court. You, you have an adversary. His name is Satan. Oh, he wants to rip you apart. He really does. I mean, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Satan hates you and wants to destroy it. Never forget that. That is so basic. Never forget it. Please, lodge that. Remember that. Satan hates you. He is a thief. He steals. He kills. He destroys. He is a liar. He is the father of lies. He is a murderer from the beginning. He wants to destroy you. This isn't science fiction. This isn't mythology. This isn't fantasy. This is Bible. He's called your adversary. And he accuses you. That one there says they're yours. But look at what they just did. That one there says... They're Christian. Did you hear what he just said to his wife? Did you see the way he just looked at that woman? Oh, she says she loves you. Did you just hear what she said about her sister? 
I thought gossip is a sin. And yet this one claims to be yours. How many sins does it take for you to go to hell? One. And the enemy is the accuser, and he accuses you night and day before the throne of God. Think about that for a minute. He's busy accusing. And you know what? No doubt about it, I'm guilty. But then my advocate walks into the courtroom, Jesus. And Jesus, who is my defense attorney, says, that one belongs to me. My blood has been applied to their sin. They have confessed, and they've been forgiven. And God's holy gavel hits that desk, and he says, not guilty. Now, that's good news. That is good news. That's good news. That really is. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Because the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's why. It wasn't cheap. Grace is not cheap. But it was so costly that we will give our lives to follow him every day for what he has done for us. There's a man we're all familiar with. His name is Job. One of these days, we're going to meet him face to face in heaven. And Job was going through such terrible times that he cried out. And he wished that he had someone who could be his defense attorney. It's found in the book of Job, chapter 9, verses 30 through 35. He said, even if I were to wash myself with soap and cleanse my hands with lye to make them absolutely clean, you would plunge me into a muddy ditch, and I would be so filthy, my own clothing would hate me. God is not a mortal like me, so I cannot argue with him or take him to trial. If only there were a mediator who could bring us together, but there is none. The mediator could make God stop beating me. I would no longer live in terror of his punishment. Then I could speak to him without fear, but I cannot do that in my own strength. Jesus is your mediator. What Job had wanted, we have. And that's what Jesus is portrayed here as doing. He, he, John is saying we have nothing that we can plead before God to gain forgiveness. But Jesus acts as our defense attorney, and he pleads our case before his Father. In Hebrews 7, 25, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. He makes intercession for them, and he makes intercession for us. Now, Jesus, according to verse 2, is what is called the propitiation. The word propitiation speaks of appeasing the anger of God. You see, God is angry with sin. In Psalm 7, verse 11, God is a righteous judge, a God who expresses his wrath every day. In John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever rejects the Son will not see life, but God's wrath remains on him. And because God is angry with sinners and hates sin, God has dealt with it, and he did it personally. So Jesus not only is our advocate, he is our atoning sacrifice. He is the propitiation for our sins. Jesus died for our sins. He died for the sins of the whole world. And because of that, verse 3, by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him, and by this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Salvation, in other words, is more than simply gaining information about God. It says in verse 3, we know that we know him if, notice, if we keep his commandments. So, how do you know if you really love God? Here's a simple test. How do you know? The answer is very basic. You have a desire to keep his commandments. The word keep means to attend to carefully, to take care of as if you were guarding a treasure. To a Christian, 
God's word is precious and to be carefully followed. God's word changes our lives. And the sign that one knows God is obedience to his commands and a life pleasing to him. There are those who wonder whether or not they're right with the Lord. They question their relationship to God, and they may have a right to do so. If living in accordance to his word is not your concern, if you don't really care, it's pretty obvious that you may not know him. In John 8, 47, it says, He who is of God hears God's words. But Jesus went on to say, Therefore you do not hear, because you're not of God. In John 14, 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved of my Father. I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Yeah, do you love, do you love his word? Do you, do you treasure it as... It within you, do, do you seek it as, as more important than your daily bread? Um, is, is God's word that important to you? When, when you hear a Bible study, and, and, and I think I'm speaking to people who, who can say, yes, it is that important to me, but it's a good, it's a good thing to, to consider. When you hear a Bible study, do you, do you say, Lord, I, 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 I'm listening so that I might obey. I want my life to be changed. I, I'm, I'm not looking... I'm not looking at the Bible study for opportunities to find uh, permission to express some less of my flesh. I, I actually want to live in such a way that I, I really do bring honor to you. I, I've shared this before. Some of you have heard me say it. I've said it in various places. I've said it in our church. I, I've said it like this. I, I want to live a life in such a way that when my children will speak at my funeral, when they do speak at my funeral, I don't want them to have to say things that aren't true about me to make me look good. I would like to live a life that they could stand up and with all honesty say, this is a man who loved Jesus Christ. That's really what I want. That, that is my goal. And, and, and some people don't understand that. Sometimes they, they think that's even melodramatic, but it's, it's just absolutely true. Listen, I, I, I stood up and I gave messages at my father's funeral and my mom's funeral and the things I wanted to say about them are the things that people needed to know. They needed to know. And, and I want to live in such a way that, that when my sons, if they can, it would be difficult for them to do this, but to come up, to be able to come up and say, this is my father. And these are the things that he loved. I want to live that way. That, that matters, guys. That matters. And, and it, maybe you think I'm just an old man rambling up here, and that's a possibility. Maybe I am, <laughs> but it's true. And you may be thinking, oh, I'm young. That, that doesn't matter. Yes, it does. I, I'll tell you, man, turn around, and, and you're an old person. Turn around. Just turn around, and you're an old person. That's just a bottom line fact, and it's a bottom line fact. It's a fact, you know. Should the Lord grant you long life, uh, you'll discover that. And then you discover... Um, how much time you wasted on things that don't really matter. That really, they just don't. They don't matter. It doesn't matter. Oh, she, did, she didn't eat lunch with me. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get those shoes. I needed those shoes, you know that. None of that matters. Jesus taught us that. Your life does not consist in the abundance of the things that you possess. You know, there's only one thing, and I'm telling you, it's so important. This is basic, basic Christianity, so basic. Well done, my good and my faithful servant, is what you want to hear. That's what you want to hear. You don't want to hear anything other than that. I am telling you, you want to hear well done, well done. And so it doesn't just happen. It's something that you die to self daily and pursue him with greater urgency over time. You don't want to live in habitual sin any longer. You want to be free from its bondage. And so John is saying, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Our, is his word dear to us? Do we desire to obey him? Do we want to keep? Now, I want you to note the word commandments, because I'm going to show you something in a second. If we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. So somebody says, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, you know, I'm a Christian, you know, pass that doobie over here, or whatever you call it now. 
that medicinal or whatever. I just want to keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome. They set you free. Now, John is saying somebody who confesses Jesus but doesn't truly obey him is not telling the truth. And that's one of the ways a false Christian will be revealed. Now, again, this isn't giving us a command to judge one another, but it is a call to be discerning. In a time when some were professing to be Christians, believers needed to be wise. Now, notice something here when he says in verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected. Now, when you looked at verse 3, it says, keep his commandments. Notice verse 4. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments. But now we have verse 5, whoever keeps his word. There's a difference. Let me share with you the basic difference. This will help you. It's helped me anyway. I hope it helps you too. Commandments. Word. Do they mean the same thing? The answer is no. Commandments are things that God said specifically that pertain to what you should do or not do. Word speaks about something a bit different. When he speaks concerning word, it is not necessarily a written command, but is an insight into his wishes. Now, what do I mean by that? It's easy to illustrate. Uh, I've got a lot of parents in here. Perhaps some of you have children who have gotten into their teen years. I had four teenagers. Oh, I felt so sorry for Marie. <laughs> so you have a son. You say to your son, listen, son, where are you going? Your son says, I'm going to go over to Bill's house. You say to your son, Bill, huh? You know, son, I really I don't feel good about Bill. I think that he's kind of a sneaky kind of guy. I think he's influencing you in a way that I don't want you influenced. So I don't want you to go to Bill's house. OK, Dad. So later on, he comes home. And you say, where'd you go? I went to Jim's house. Now, who was there? Oh, Chris and Mike and Bill. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Anybody ever hear anything like that? Now, wait a minute. I said I didn't want you hanging around Bill. No, you didn't. What you said is you don't want me to go to his house. And I didn't go to his house. He went to Jim's house. Anybody ever hear anything like that? What, what are you dealing with? Commandments and words. That's the difference. A commandment is specific. Word is intent. So it may not specifically say, thou shalt not shoot up heroin. Thou shalt not drink boilermakers. It doesn't say it specifically. It says I'm not supposed to be drunk on wine. But it doesn't say that I... And that's when you start playing with the word of God to try and find a loophole to do the thing that you want to do. And he said it's not just a specific command it's also knowing the wishes of your God. And what is it? What is it? It's, it's saying, love him so much that you don't want to do anything that you feel would be displeasing to him. Is that heavy? Is that, that is heavy. Because that's demanding. Not that we should imagine, oh, I'm going to imagine a bunch of things and become a Pharisee. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, Lord, I just, I want to live in a, a, a life in a way that you're pleased, you're pleased with me. And, and I want to keep your commandments, but I also want to keep the essence of your word. I want to keep the flow of it. 
Um, you want me to live a pure life? You didn't give me specific commands pertaining to every single thing in life, but you did say this. You did say that I should pursue you with all of my heart. You did say that I should love you, and that's what I want to do. And, and I want to keep your commands, the things that you specifically have told me to do. I want to do that. And even the things that, that I'm, it may not be specifically saying I can't do that, I want to be careful that I just live in a way that pleases you. And, and the point he's making isn't that we get into legalism at all. It's that we just love God enough to just stay away from the things that he's grieved by. Just love him like that. Hey, that's Christianity. Anything less than that, we're not really, really loving him, are we? Anything less than just my whole heart on a daily basis. You know, when I first got saved and somebody said, you need to love the Lord and this and that, I said, man, I don't know. I, 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 I you know, I want to, but I'm not sure that I, I've got it in me. It's not that at all. It's that he gives the Holy Spirit to live within you, and all you need to do is begin to love him and just enjoy him. And, and I'm, I'm, I guarantee you, the more you enjoy him, uh, the less things that displease him you'll find yourself doing. It's because you love him and you want to be close to him. It's not that hard. It really isn't. You see, the first test of a disciple is your attitude. Do you desire to not only do what is expressly said, but also what could be inferred? And, and then there's my activity or my action. Am I obedient to what he says? You see, if, if I want to, want to please him and I'm obedient to what I know, then God's love will be matured in my life. And then finally, he says in verse 6, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. He walked, how did he walk? Well, Jesus walked with sacrifice. In 1 Peter 2.21, to this you were called, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow his steps. So he had a sacrificial walk. We walk in love. Ephesians 5 verse 2, live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And, and then we walk in service. Like it says in John 13, 15, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. We walk with sacrifice, we walk in love, and we walk in service. If I really love the Lord, if I'm really abiding in him, I'm going to walk like he did. I have a grandson, two grandsons, my Josiah, whom I love with all of my heart. And the latest one, his name is David, David Aaron. David Aaron looks like me. I like that. <laughs> I was in my, um, in the foyer here at our church just this afternoon my son David was here and his son David's with him and um, one of our ladies said I've never noticed this she said something like this the way you are standing here and your son standing there you guys actually look alike and I said yeah but you know who really looks like me is the baby and if my mom were still with us my mom would say that. She'd say, oh, that baby looks just like you. And he does. And I like it. <laughs> I really do. I, I like it. I mean, he's got light skin like his daddy and his grandpa. He's got brown hair. I have baby pictures that if I put next to him, you'd think they're the same person. It's rather cool. It's rather cool. Why am I rambling on like that? Um, I'm old. <laughs> it's because there's a certain joy that you have when one of your kids or baby, grandbabies, when they look like you. That's a fact. That's just a fact. Could it be that the Lord God may have a certain joy when his children are acting like him? You think that's possible? That he'd be pleased with you? 
because you're walking in sacrifice, you're walking in service, you're walking in love, just like him? You think that would please the Father? I believe Scripture says it does. It pleases him because you're like him. Because isn't that what a Christian is? By the way, you know the word Christian simply means little Christ? That's what it means. Little Christ or Christ-like. That's what Christian means. It used to be a word that was a slam on Christians. They were first called Christians in Antioch. And it was a slam. Oh, there go those little Christs. It was a slam. They were actually putting them down. They think that it was a, it, it was a knock on them. And we turned it around and we said, no, that's what we want to be, like him. We want to be like him. And what is he? He loves. He sacrifices. He serves. And so if any man says or any woman says that they know him, they walk like him, a walk in the light.